ask you six questions today that will hopefully help you diagnose where you stand with God, hopefully help you diagnose where you stand with God. A lot of people come to church now and then or even regularly and many assume that they're doing quite well with God. Many assume that they are doing quite well with God. And just as we regularly go for a medical checkup from time to time, or we get our teeth checked up from time to time, how much more important is to have a checkup on our soul? How much more important is it to evaluate the state of our own souls before the Lord. And so today, I'm going to ask some questions that will help you to evaluate the state of your own soul. And as we talk about this, I think it's very important to note that evaluating the health of your own soul is much more important than evaluating the health of your own body, and much more important than certainly evaluating the health of your teeth, as you would regularly at a dentist. Because eternity is a long time. Eternity is a long time. And so what I want you to do before we begin our little diagnostic test, I would like you to imagine, if it were possible, a bird that flew to the planet Earth from a far distant planet. So imagine there's this little bird, and this little bird is in a far distant planet, perhaps in another solar system. And if it were possible for this to happen, just imagine if it were possible, if a bird could actually do this. And the bird was to land on planet Earth. And he lands on planet Earth, and he picks up a grain of sand on one of our beaches. There are many beaches on this planet, as you know. And then he flies back to his far distant planet, billions of miles away. And he leaves that one grain of sand on his far distant planet. It's right there. And he takes flight again. And he flies back to our planet, our home. And he lands on that same beach. And he picks up another grain of sand in his beak, takes flight. And then he takes that grain of sand with him as he travels through galaxies and lands on his own planet billions and billions of years or billions and billions of miles away and drops his grain of sand. So now there's two grains, two of Earth's grains of sand on his planet. And then he travels back for a third time. And by now, like this is many years that have passed, you could imagine. Billions of years, probably, the distance between just the bird. He's traveling at a normal rate of a normal bird. It could be a pigeon or a seagull or something like that. Normal rate. And he lands again on one of our beaches, and he does the same for fourth time. And now we have four, five, six grains of sand, one by one, one by one, being taken from Earth to his planet, from Earth to his planet, to the point where all of Earth's beaches have now lost all of their sand because this bird has been flying to and fro. Planet Earth, his planet, planet Earth, his planet, one grain of sand at a time. And he empties all of our beaches of sand so there's no more sand left. And then this same bird takes up a grain of sand as he lands on one of Earth's deserts. And then he does the same thing. And he brings that grain of sand back to his planet, 
and leaves it there, and he does it again, one grain of sand at a time, one grain of sand at a time, and you can imagine how much time has elapsed by this point, but he does it until all of earth's beaches are completely absent of any sand, and all of earth's deserts are completely absent of any sand, for all of earth's deserts and all of earth's beaches have now been emptied, grain of sand, grain of sand, grain of sand, onto this far distant planet by this one little meager bird. That would take a long time. When that is completed, and we have no more sand left on the face of the earth, eternity is so long that it has just begun. That's how long eternity is. It's just begun. Where are you going to spend eternity? Because it's a very long time. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 22 to 28, I will read. And then I will ask six diagnostic questions. You did not call upon me, O Jacob. And when he's speaking of Jacob or Israel, he's speaking of the people of God collectively. But you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. You have not brought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities." I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. Your first father sinned, and your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and deliver Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. This is the word of the Lord. Let's have prayer together. Father in heaven, we pray that you would bless our time. We pray that you would strengthen us as we look at your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that through the Word of God, you would reveal Christ to us. And if there are any in this room, as I'm sure there are, who do not know Christ and who are not ready to meet Him on the day of judgment, that you will convert the lost today. We pray for those among us who have been deluded and deceived into thinking they are saved when they in reality are not. Praying, Father, that you would bring about conviction of sin and point them to Christ, and for all of us that you would press our hearts with eternity today, that we all may leave devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we depend upon you for this work, We depend upon you for this grace. I personally, being a weak earthen vessel, depend upon you to fill me to the uttermost. And praying, Father, that you would lead through the preaching of your word, bit by bit, precept by precept, verse by verse, and that your law would prove itself powerful and that the gospel would prove itself to be a great bomb this morning. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. There's no more important question to ask than where will you spend eternity? There's no more important thought that could be occupying your mind than the thoughts of eternity. And in this day and age, we often like to numb these thoughts with distractions, whether they be entertainment. Many numb them with the distractions of drugs whether they be legal or illegal. 
Many numb, these, many numb their thoughts of eternity with indulgence in alcohol or in immorality, and it takes the mind away from thoughts of eternity. But the most important thought that we can have is the thought of our eternal state. Where will you spend eternity? And before you answer me smugly and say, well, of course I'll go to heaven. God is loving and God is benevolent. And you think that you're saved just by the virtue of the fact that you'll die one day. I want you to behold the word of God and see what it has to say. And I'm going to ask six diagnostic questions about the state of your soul. As you personally seek to evaluate your eternal state and do business with God. And the first question I want to ask you is found in verse 22, and it is this. Do you call upon God? Do you call personally as an individual? Do you call upon the Lord? Do you call upon the Lord? And so if you look at verse 22, this is, this is a word of God. This is God actually speaking directly through the prophet Isaiah. God has given the prophet Isaiah a message for a group of people. The message still applies today. And the message actually is a word of indictment against a people who do not call upon the Lord. And the passage begins in verse 22 with this little word that says, yet. You notice that? It says, yet. Why would that word, yet, be there? What it says, yet you did not call upon me. And what that word, yet, is doing is it is linking this passage, this indictment of people who do not call upon the name of the Lord, who do not call upon God, it is linking them or linking this passage with verse 20 and 21. And so something has this just been said in verse 20 and 21 that is leading God to say to Jacob, to Israel, when he speaks of Jacob and he speaks of Israel, he's speaking about the people of God and to tell them they do not call upon the Lord. So so look at what it says in verse 20. It says, the wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. So what he's saying is, look, the beasts, the wild beasts do what I say. They live according to the plan that I have laid out for them. There are jackals and there are ostriches, and I have given them water, I have provided for them, and they live out the plan that I have given for them. And then he says, to give drink to my chosen people, to people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. So what he says is, I've provided for the jackals and the beasts of the wilderness, and I have also provided for my people. And there's a purpose that he is, for which he has provided for his people. So, so God gives the gift of provision to his people with a purpose in mind. And the purpose that God has in mind is he gives gifts to his people is the purpose of his praise. Okay? And so when God gives you water to drink so that you don't dehydrate, okay? And when God gives you food to fill your belly so that you don't starve and that you have nutrients, and when you wake up in the morning alive, which is a gift from the Lord in and of itself, the Lord is giving you these things so that you will do something with them, okay? So I... I used to work in construction. I've told you this. And my boss gave me a very nice hammer to work with. Okay? And I remember my first day on the job, I was not using my hammer. I wasn't swinging it properly the most effective way. So in his very gruff way, he scolded me. 
and made sure that I would always now forever after swing that hammer the way that he wanted me to swing it so as to be most effective in doing the job that I, he was paying me to do. So God, God's given you something. And what has the Lord given you? He's given you water, he's given you food, he's given you life, he's given you another day, and he's given it to you as a tool. This is what it says. He's given it to you as a tool. A tool to do one thing at least, and the tool is to declare his praise. It's to declare his praise. And so if you take the energy and the life that the Lord has given you, and you don't use it in a way that he wants you to use it, that means that you are now living in disobedience to God. And just like I could have used that hammer in a way that would not have been acceptable to my boss, so you could use the air that you breathe, the water that you drink, the food that you eat, the sleep that you have for rest, and the day that you have for a purpose that is contrary to the Lord. And the, and, and chat, in verse 22, God calls out his people for doing just that. You're not using this stuff for what it was intended. You do not declare my praise. You do not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. Do you understand? This is a people that won't worship God. This is a people, so, so, so evaluate your own spiritual life. Do you call upon the name of the Lord? I'm just asking. Do you have a time in the day where you actually pray to God? Because apparently he's given you food and drink and sleep and life for the purpose of calling to him. And and so for those of you who have families, I'm just asking this diagnostic question. That's all I'm doing. Do you have a time where you have actually set apart time is a family to worship the Lord together? On a regular basis. And it's a time of prayer. It's a time of singing to God. And and a time of reading his word. Very simple. You see? Do you call upon the name of the Lord? Because this is why God has given you life. Or, Or how about this? This is really simple. Do you come to be with the people of the Lord to worship him on a regular basis? So that you can be with God's people and you can gather with God's people and you can sing his praise. And then when you come to be with God's people, what is the purpose of your coming to be with God's people? I know many will say, well, I come to hear a word from the Lord and to be fed from the Holy Scriptures. But there's more to that. There's a reason you're being fed from the Holy Scriptures and it's the same reason you're being fed meat and bread and water and potatoes. And the reason you're being fed from the Holy Scriptures, again, we find it here, is that so you can declare his praise and so when you enter into the household of God and and the building is not the household of God but the gathered people are the household of God so when we come together there's a very real sense in which we're entering into the household of God do you gather with the hopes that you will be able to sing praise to God to lift your voices to the Lord, not because you have to, not because it's a, it's a massive burden, but because you long to return to the creator what he has given to you. That's the first diagnostic question. How's that going for you? How's the calling upon the name of the Lord going for you? How's the calling to the Lord going for you? Because this is an indictment against people who don't call upon God in praise. And and it's not just showing up with God, well, here's a list of things I'd like you to do. This is actually showing up to God and saying, this is who you are, and I am thankful. I am thankful. So here's another diagnostic question. First one is, do you call upon the name of the Lord? How about this? Does God exhaust you? And by the way, if you answer yes to this, that's not a good thing. Okay, you're supposed to, a good Answer to the first question, do you call upon the name of the Lord? But yes, I call upon the name of the Lord. But then I ask the question, does God exhaust you? Then you got a, a good answer to that would be like, no, he doesn't exhaust me at all. So look at what it says. You did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. So the very opposite of calling upon the name of the Lord is being weary of the Lord. And what does it mean to be weary of the Lord? I would say that we live in a generation, we live in a day and age that is characterized by weariness towards the Lord. 
And so you receive a strong exhortation in church. Well, you should be praying, like I just gave you, right? You receive a strong exhortation in church. Well, you should be having a time of family worship and, and leading your home in the praises of God. Or you have an exhortation. You should be in church, not just gathering to hear the word of God preach, but you should be in church gathering to sing to the Lord. And, the, and, and you know what the natural inclination of the heart is? Oh, that's so hard. I got to do that. And that's being weary of the Lord. Because God's saying, I've given you these things to praise me. You don't praise me, and instead of praising me, you're weary of the fact that I asked for your praise. This is what he's saying. This is a rebuke on anyone who would hate to hear a pastor say, or hate to hear the scripture say, you should pray, you should worship, you should sing. In fact, because you truly love God, you should sing louder. Like, do you resist that? Because if you're resisting it, this is an indictment against you. Your spiritual health is not good. I don't like to hear that. Are we living a day and age that I think is characterized by exhaustion when it comes to the commandments of God? Oh, don't be so judgmental because it's so, I don't want to hear about what the Bible expects of me. Are we living in a day and age where I think we're, we're exhausted by indictments of God's judgment? Don't talk about hell. Please don't talk about judgment. Oh, please don't talk about the sins and the specific sins of our society. I find it very embarrassing. I find it very uncomfortable. And in fact, I find it very exhausting because it makes me feel bad. Does it exhaust you to hear that you need to be reading your Bible, that, it, that you need to be serving the Lord, to hear threats about the coming judgment and to hear of the commandments of God? Because here's two questions to diagnose your spiritual health. One is, do you call upon the Lord? And two is, does God exhaust you? I mean, I don't find watching the hockey game exhausting. I don't find shouting the at the television when there's a goal of my favorite team exhausting. I don't find fishing exhausting. In fact, I'll spend a lot of money on tackle if I want to. I mean, I don't, I don't find playing my favorite sport exhausting. Some of you, maybe it's I don't find drinking exhausting. Don't find drugs exhausting. But man, when it comes to the things of God, that is exhausting to me. And, and then you go back to this, well, why did God give you breath? Why did God give you air? Why did God give you food? Why did God give you water? Why did he give you any of these things? He gave them to you for himself so that you will use these tools to the praise of his glory. Does God exhaust you? Do you hate hearing commandments from God and warnings about his judgment? If God exhausts you in any of those ways, that would tell me that your spiritual health is not good. And I think we live in a day of very low ebb spirituality where you can say, well, you know what, I'm a little better than the rest of this godless word, so I have a very high level of spirituality. I have a bunch of godless neighbors that don't even think about the Lord, and, I, and therefore I have a very high level of spirituality because I think about God at least twice a day. And this text is saying, no, you, are you weary of hearing about God all the time? Are you weary of the commandments of God? Are you weary of calling upon the Lord? And if so, there's a big problem. There's a big problem. So do you call upon the Lord? Does God exhaust you? How about this? Here's the third question I'm going to ask. What have you given to God? What have you given to God? I think this is a very important question, considering who we are in light of God. Like, you think about who you are. What does the Bible say you are? Well, the Bible says you're created from the dust of the earth. So God looked at some dirt, and then he formed you out of the dirt, and then he breathed into the dirt, and then everything that you have in your life is given to you from God. You say, well, I've worked hard for everything that I have in my life. Yeah, but who puts you in a country where, that rewards hard work? Who gave you the health to work hard? Who gave you the job to work hard? There's some countries in the world, and I've been to them, where if you work hard, it doesn't matter. You're not getting anything. There's nothing there. Their economy is not set up this way. We live in a country where at least still there is rewards for hard, honest work. 
What have you given to God? Well, look at what it says in verse 23. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. And when he's talking about that, uh, when the Lord is talking about that under the Old Testament law, the people were, it was an agrarian society. They're farmers. And the people are supposed to bring their sheep without blemish to the Lord for a sacrifice. And then the sheep would have been killed, and this was an offering up to God, and its remains would have been burnt upon the altar. And then some of the food that was left over would have been used to feed the priests who would offer the offering on behalf of the people. And so this was something that God would require of the people. You bring these into your time of worship, you make an offering, and and, and you give them to the Lord. It is an act of offering to atone for sin and to satisfy the deity. And the Lord is simply saying, you're not bringing your offerings to God. And you say, well, that's, not, that's Old Testament. What's new? Well, the New Testament concept is, is, is quite simple. It's okay, you're not bringing sheep and rams into your worship service so we can sacrifice them up here. But what you're doing is you're giving your whole self to the Lord. The Apostle Paul said at the end of his life, he said, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. We're supposed to present our bodies, our entire lives, our entire beings as sacrifices to the Lord in the sense that we're giving everything. We're not letting up on the gas. We're giving everything to God. And so the question is, have you brought sacrifices? Have you sacrificially given to God? And he goes on, he says, I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. And this is simply saying that the Lord is not a mean, harsh God, he does not require something that he has not given to his people. He's already given them a great deal of stuff, and he's not requiring that they sacrifice everything on the altar. They're simply requiring that they sacrifice, you know, every now and then. It's not saying they can't enjoy life. He's simply saying, what have you brought, and I've given you so much, and you bring me nothing. And then he goes on in verse 24, you have not brought me sweet cane with money, or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. So again, we have this whole concept of sacrifice here, and this is kind of talking about luxury items in the sense that these are, this is voluntary giving. And so if you look at the book of Exodus, which I've been reading through devotionally, and you look at chapter 27 through 30, it talks about the construction of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and the priestly garments and the way that the Old Testament community constructed the Ark of the Tabernacle, and there was gold and bronze, and there was fancy embroideries within it, and then, the, and then the Ark of the Covenant, again, gold and expensive woods formed the Ark of the Covenant, and, and then the, the two cherubs that would sit and form the mercy seat on, on top of the Ark of the Covenant. All of these things, the tabernacle, were you were were voluntary voluntary gifts from the people. And so Moses would stand up in front of the people and say, well, each one give according to uh, his desire. And an evidence of the Spirit of God at work in the Old Testament community is that Moses didn't need to lay guilt trips on them to bring all of this stuff so that these tab the tabernacle and, and the court of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant can be formed. He didn't need to lay guilt chips. He'd just say, can you please bring stuff voluntarily? And then they would trust the Spirit of God to move within the people's hearts to bring their various items, whether it be gold, whether it be bronze, whether it be wood, whether it be fancy embroideries or incense. In this case, when it talks about the sweet cane, which would have been produced a nice perfume. And, and what, what we're being told here is the people are keeping everything for themselves. And they don't want to give the Lord anything. There's no aspect of their life that is voluntarily offered up to the Lord because life is for me. Life is for pleasure. Life is for my good. Life is for my entertainment. I've worked hard for my life, and I'm going to get what I want out of my life. And, and then he, and, and he, and he says uh, further on um, in this passage, 
or you have not satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. At the end of verse 24, or the middle of verse 24, you have not satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. So if they're bringing him offerings, it's lean, frail offerings, not the best offerings. So the people have the option between choosing a fat ram or a skinny ram. They choose the skinny ram because they want to eat the fat ram for their family. And what they're saying is, I don't trust God enough, and I'm selfish, and I'm ungrateful, and so I'm giving the Lord the most meager part of my offering. And so my simple question, question to you is, is what are you bringing to the Lord? Are you bringing to the Lord fruits of repentance? Are you bringing to the Lord humility? Do you see all of your stuff is belonging to the Lord and when you simply give to his work, you're returning to him what he's already entrusted to you? And what I, what I feel like sometimes we can, we can be guilty of, sometimes we can be guilty, you know it would be a really offensive thing to give a waiter a nickel for a tip? The waiter brings the food, the waiter brings the drinks, the waiter serves the table. You're better off not to leave a tip for the waiter than give him a nickel. It's an, it's an offensive thing. Or, or it's kind of like this. We've got, we got two guys. One guy's name is full and the other guy's name is hungry. Okay? One guy's name is full and the other guy's name is hungry. And the one guy's full because he just ate a meal and the one guy's hungry because he didn't eat a meal. He's hungry. And the guy that's full, he eats his meal and he sees hungry and he says, you know what, I'm going to be a really nice guy, so I'm going to give hungry some food. And so he has a nice plate of steak and he has some potato and I don't know, your favorite vegetable, maybe it's asparagus or something like that, I don't know what it is, okay? Brussels sprouts. And, and he has his steak, he has his potato, he has his nice lush vegetable on the plate and he eats it all up, carves it up and eats it and then there's a few meager scraps of the potato left on the plate. There's a few pieces of chewed up meat on the plate. And maybe there's some butter that's dripped off the asparagus left on the plate. And, and Hungry says, or Full says, I'm going to give Hungry what's left over on my plate because I'm a really benevolent guy. So Full takes his plate of a few scraps and he offers it to Hungry. And he says, here you go, Hungry. Aren't you helpful? And Hungry looks at him and says, what the heck? Because hungry is the guy that just fed him the meal and stood there and watched him eat it. See? He prepared the meal, he fed him the meal, he served the meal, and he's standing there hungry because he didn't eat for himself. He was more concerned about the other person that he was feeding, and the guy that's being fed is so thoughtful because he leaves a few scraps. And I think, I don't believe the Lord's hungry. He doesn't need any of our stuff. But I think quite often, we deal with the Lord that way. We give him our scraps that are left over on the table and say, well, here you go, God. I'm really jealous, and, or I'm really, I'm, I'm really generous. And we toss him a nickel, and we say, you know, that's how I treat the Lord. We wouldn't treat a waiter that way. We wouldn't treat a barber that way. And if an employer treated us that way, we wouldn't be happy. But that's so often how we treat the Lord. So that's the third question. What have you given to the Lord? Here's the fourth question. Have you burdened the Lord? Look at what it says. Verse 24, you have not brought me sweet Cain, or bought me sweet cane with money, verse 24, or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins and you have wearied me with your iniquities. Do you understand what this is saying? He's dealing with the people who won't call upon him. He's dealing with the people who are exhausted by him. They're burdened by the Lord. They feel as if they are. He's dealing with the people that give him nothing, and if they give him anything, it's their scraps. And then he says, and you know what you people bring to me? You bring to me your sins. Have you... And this is a legitimate burden for the Lord because he looks over the face of the earth and he says, I made this beautiful planet. And I've put these people on this planet to care for the planet and for their enjoyment and for my glory. And then what they do is they sin on the planet. And, and any of you who have children, you can relate to this to a, little, to a little bit. What would you do if you prepared a beautiful feast for your children and they despised you for it? Or you provided a great life for your children and they hated you for it. And they said, I don't want to give anything to you. You miserable curse you, and how dare you demand my praise? Or, or what? I mean, maybe you don't even provide something. Maybe you just live next door to someone that drives you nuts. You ever live next door to people that are, are kind of wild in their living? So I grew up in Guelph, and we had university students that would rent around our house, okay? And some of them weren't very nice. And some of them would party late at night, and you would hear their noise. 
and you would see their vomit at times, okay? And I remember at least one time, there were beer bottles that were left in backyards. Like, you don't even give those people those things, but they live beside you. Never mind a God who gives you things and then you abuse what he's given you. This is a Lord who says, I am actually burdened by the sins of the people on the face of the earth. And he looks out upon us and he feels the burden of it. Just like you look at, out at your best friend or your family member or somebody you love and you see the way that they've wrecked their life and you say, oh, this is just killing me to watch this. This is how the Lord feels. So have you burdened him with your sins? I ask another question, who is God? And I think this question really kind of sums it up, the way we answer it. Who is God? Look at how he introduces himself. Who is God? I've said, do you call upon the Lord? Does God exhaust you? What have you given to the Lord? Have you burdened God? And then I asked this question in verse 5. I said, who is God? And at verse 25, and he, said, he introduces himself. Listen to him introduce himself. You are a people who don't call upon me. You are a people who exhaust me or who are exhausted by me. You are people who have given nothing. You are people who feel, who have burdened the Lord. And then in verse 25, he introduces himself and he says, I, I am he. This is emphatic. This is emphatic. I'm the one. And who does he introduce himself as? How does he, enter, how does he like to be identified? How does he self-identify? Verse 25, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Do you get this? He identifies himself as the forgiver of sins. Emphatically, I, I am he. He is the one who forgives sins. And then like he says, past sins, who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. What does that mean? Well, so I've just listed a whole bunch of things. There's people who don't call upon the Lord. There's people who feel exhausted by the Lord. There's people who don't give to the Lord. There's people who burden the Lord with their sins. And what the Lord says, he says, I've got all your sins listed in a book, all of these things and even then some more. And I've kept a tally of them, like an accountant keeps track of money. And then what I've done, the Lord says he's done, is he's taken white out and he's run it right through the whole book so he doesn't look at your sins. He washes them away. All sins in the past. You say, well, that's great. So can he ever take that white out off? And it says here um, in verse 25, he is the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. But further, this is a future thing. I will not remember your sins. They're never coming back. And so have you ever gone out on a day like this morning and it's, there's a misty fog on the road and as you drive... You can't see in front of you, but you know very well that's not going to last, right? Like the sun's going to rise, and maybe it already has, I'm sure it has, and the fog has burnt up, and now it's clear driving down the highway. And that same fog, I mean, you might get another fog back, uh, you know, a few weeks from now or months from now, but that same fog will never return. It's forever being burnt off the highway. And your sins, when the Lord forgives and pardons your sins, he burns them away so that you and he will never see them again. He will not remember them. They will be erased from his memory permanently. They'll be blotted out, is white out on an accountant sheet. I was, I'll tell you this, I, I was preparing a paper a little while ago for a talk that I had to give. And I'd spent hours on this. Hours. 10, 12 pages long. Okay. And have you ever done this? I accidentally hit close on the file. Okay, you know where this is going? I accidentally hit close, the little X, top right hand. Accidentally hit close. And then after I hit close, I've been working so hard, it says, I didn't know what happened. And it, and, and it had this thing that said, proceed or don't proceed. I can't remember what it says. It says, save or don't save. And I just hit don't save because I'm like, get this stupid box out of my screen and let me keep typing. Right? Well, what happened is the whole file shut down. And I panicked. I thought, I've lost everything. Well, I'll tell you what, that's what happens to your sins. He shuts it down. The file is lost. The file is deleted. Now, just so you know, Will Sherman helped me recover it, okay? <laughs> he helped me recover it. But that's not how the Lord works. It's unrecoverable. Completely so. And you say, well, how is this possible? 
How is this possible? Because here's how it's possible. Is the Lord Jesus Christ marched to the cross and he bore the burden of your sins on his shoulders if you believe in him. He took them and he, he put your sins on his shoulders. And your name is engraved in his very soul so that he is your representative on the cross and God looks at Christ and in love for you punishes Christ on your behalf so do you, you do not need to bear your own sins. God bears the burden of your sins himself in Christ out of love for sinners like you and me, out of love for people who refuse to call upon God. Out of love for people who are exhausted by God. Out of love for people who give God nothing but table scraps. And out of love for people who truly and in every real way burden God with our sins. In this sense, the burdening of God with our sins actually leads to our salvation. Because Christ took the burden of our sins upon his back and he went to the cross. And one of the things that they did in the Old Testament sacrificial system is we're talking about sacrifices, and we know this points to Christ. The Old Testament sacrificial system did is they would take the bull that they were going to sacrifice, and they'd, 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 the, the priests would lay their hands on the head of the bull in front of all the people, and they would kill the bull. It was a gruesome sight, okay? And they would take the blood of the bull, and they would sprinkle it on the altar, and then they would take the innards of the bull and they would put his innards on the altar, okay, like his guts. And then they would take the flesh of the bull and the dung of the bull and they would move it outside of the camp. And so on the altar, they would burn the innards and on the outside of the camp, they would burn the carcass. And as you think about this, you think, well, that's just a really quick burn. I mean, sometimes you, you burn something and, it, and it's very quick. It's like a piece of straw or a paper. I mean, it's done. But we're talking about a massive animal that has lots of flesh. And, I mean, how long does it take you to cook a steak on your barbecue? Okay? How long does it take you to cook a roast in your slow cooker? It takes you a while. And so my point in saying all this is the burning of the innards of the bull and the burning of the carcass of the bull, it, it wasn't something that happened in an instance. It was a slow burn that went on that produced a, an aroma up into the nostrils of God. And when Christ died on the cross, it was a slow, steady burning of the wrath of God on his flesh and in his innards. His very soul was roasted. And it was a slow roast. The anguish of soul that Christ experienced on the cross was a slow burning anguish. And then finally, when it was fully done and the sacrifice had been complete, he said, it is finished. And why did that happen? Well, it happened because people like you and me refuse to call upon God because we feel exhausted by God because we don't give to God and our sins burden God. And so God offers himself up as a sacrifice and he welcomes burdened sinners to the cross so that you can have your sins forgiven. And so I got one more diagnostic question to ask before we wrap this whole thing up. Do you call upon God? I ask that. Does God exhaust you? I ask that. What have you given to God? I ask that. Have you burdened God? I ask that. Who is God? I ask that. He is the Savior. We talked about that. How about this one? Here's another diagnostic question. Here's the last one. Have you kept score? Who do you think is the more worthy party? I mean, have you kept score? Like, okay, God scores this and I score this. You see, when you stand before God on Judgment Day, it's not going to be your sins versus your neighbor's sins. It's your sins versus God's sins. And if you've got more sins than God, then you've got a lot of trouble. But that's why God offered Christ for you. Because you have way more sins than God. 
And the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross was crucified for sinners so that if you put your faith in him, he will take all of your sins from you and, and you will have complete redemption, complete pardon, white out over the paper. The mist is burnt out. There's a cloud in the sky and it's blown away forever by God. That's what your sins become like. They're completely disappeared, completely d- obliterated, completely gone, taken to Christ and slowly burned on the altar. Finished. You see, when Christ was slowly burning on the cross in the anger of God, Christ, your sins were slowly burning in his soul. And when the Lord Jesus Christ said, it is finished, he wasn't just saying the sacrifice is done. He is saying that God looks on you and doesn't see your sin anymore because they have been burnt up. And they're finished. And it's over. And so have you kept score? Because I've kind of read this and I've kept score and I'm like, uh, God's got a lot of points and I've got a deficit. And I don't just need someone to fill my deficit. I need someone that's going to score me as many points as God. And the only way that's going to happen is through God himself who was offered up on the cross. This is the Christ whose life was laid down for sinners. This is the Christ who was a gift for sinners. And this is the Christ who took the burden for sinners. And so I'm just going to invite you today. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and you want to have your sins blotted out, if you want to have the fog of your sins burnt away so that the Lord will look upon them no more, if you want to have your guilt removed far away and burnt up so the Lord is never going to see it again, I'm going to invite you to receive salvation today. Won't you come to the Lord Jesus Won't you be saved? Won't you know Christ?